Berg? Yes, the microphone works. Fantastic. So welcome to this uh, Bruegel event on uh, fiscal policies to promote innovation. I'm Jeremy Zettelmeyer, the director of Bruegel. I'm joined by a great uh, panel. So from uh, left, from my, I guess, my left <laughs> to my right, or from your left to your right too, if you're in the audience, we have Eda Dabla Norris, who is a deputy director in the Fiscal Affairs Department uh, of the IMF, where she is responsible for the IMF's uh, Fiscal Monitor, which is one of the, I would say, three flagship uh, publications of the IMF, the others two being the um, the um, Global Financial Stability Report and the, uh, of course, World Economic Outlook. We then have uh, Roman Arjona, who is uh, Chief Economist at DigiGrow in the European Commission and also Vice Chair of the OECD's Committee for Industry, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. We have Reinhilde Vögeles, who is a Senior Fellow here at Bruegel and a Professor uh, at KU Leuven. And we have Renaud Andries, who is a partner in the Belgian uh, practice of, of Deloitte. And so, you know, in a broad sense, we're going to talk about uh, industrial policy, except this doesn't appear in the uh, title. And so, you know, the way to relate this to the IMF is that the fund has discovered in the last uh, 10 years or so that it can talk about just about anything that's sexy these days by calling it fiscal policies for, okay? So this has been uh, done very successfully. The fund has done this actually very well, very innovatively for climate change, where the most of the competencies are in the fiscal affairs department uh, and now for, uh, for industrial policy. And in fact, the, the last two fiscal monitors are about those, uh, those topics, and, and they're great. So the fiscal monitor these days has always one very nice... Uh, thematic chapter, and this is the chapter that Ida is going to present. So Ida will go ahead with uh, about 15 minutes, and then we will have uh, shorter discussions uh, by the other three panel lists of about seven to eight minutes. Ida, go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, German. Is this on? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Jeremy, and uh, uh, for hosting me here uh, at Bruegel. It's, it's a real pleasure. Um, German and I have long debated uh, many of these issues, uh, and so I'm, I'm pleased to uh, be presenting the Fiscal Monitor uh, chapter um, to you all today. So let me just set the stage by pointing somewhere. Um, Does it help? Yeah, or if you point there, does it doesn't work? Let's see. Yeah. There we go. Let me set the stage by, by, by sort of highlighting some trends that I think are really important uh, to understand the backdrop uh, for the chapter. First, uh, the point that I'd like to make is that innovation and TFP growth in particular have been falling. Uh, and this is a trend that we see across advanced, emerging, low-income developing countries. And we know that medium-term growth prospects for most countries have dimmed. And the, the latest World Economic uh, Outlook chapter makes this point. The second uh, point is that the I innovation, as we define it, the introduction, invention of new products and processes, is the way we define it, uh, is not diffusing fast enough. And, and so the middle chart, you see that gaps, technology gaps across uh, countries uh, are really large. Um, and, and, and the gaps across frontier firms, or the top firms within countries and, and, and the laggards have also grown. And this is particularly uh, important uh, for Europe. At the same time, we're seeing these trends. Debt levels are elevated, we know, and, and fiscal space tends to be limited uh, in most countries. So alongside these structural forces that I've sort of laid out, uh, what we're seeing is a resurgence of industrial policy in many major uh, economies. You know, the U.S. Chips and Science Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, EU's uh, Green Deal, Japan's new direction in the economy and industrial policy, China's longstanding policies, they all share something in common, which is directing uh, um, support to innovation in specific sectors, such as green sectors um, and um, uh, advanced technology uh, sectors. And this has raised sort of important questions about the efficacy of such an approach uh, to foster uh, innovation. So against this backdrop what this, uh, and, and these trends that I've highlighted, what this chapter does is it asks three questions. First, um, how should governments uh, direct innovation support uh, to specific sectors using industrial policy? Should they? What are the relative costs and benefits of doing so, and how? Secondly, what are the most cost-effective fiscal instruments to promote innovation for countries at the technology frontier. So countries at the technology frontier, euphemism for more advanced 
uh, economies. And finally, how can we think about fiscal policies for fostering technology diffusion? It's not sufficient to talk about innovation at the frontier. What's really important for productivity, and we know this, is diffusion um, at um, diffusion across uh, countries and firms. Okay, so let me let me turn to the first question, and I'm going to set the stage by just sort of conceptually explaining to you what we did. So we uh, developed a model. Uh, a, a novel framework that looks at the costs and benefits of using uh, industrial policy. And we're, we're sort of agnostic at the outset. Is this good or bad? We just develop a framework. And in the framework, we, we, we have uh, governments that can provide subsidies uh, differential, at differential rates to different sectors. Okay? And sectors differ in this economy uh, based on the kind of spillovers that they have. So think about a, sort of a net network of, of, of sectors in an economy. Some sectors have higher knowledge spillovers to other sectors, and governments can direct um, um, innovation. So in a sense, the optimal allocation, if you will, in this economy is to direct innovation to those sectors that have the highest uh, knowledge spillovers, because this is good for TFP, this is good for productivity, can boost uh, growth prospects. At the same time, we can have uh, 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 governments potentially allocating sectors, uh, allocating subsidies to sectors that are politically connected, uh, uh, in other words, you know, there can be a misallocation of resources. And governments can also allocate uh, subsidies uh, to sectors uh, that to achieve specific purposes, green uh, uh, innovation to, to spur uh, the development of low carbon uh, technology. So that's sort of the, the, the framework that, that we have in uh, uh, mind. And you know, before going to the, sort of the meat of the results, I just wanted to sort of highlight an important point. Right? And the point is this. Not surprising that some sectors will tend to generate higher knowledge spillovers to, to other sectors. Right? So it makes it, it may make sense to, and, and if, if, if you're a country with a large number of these domestic spillovers, it may make sense uh, for, for, from your own perspective to use these kind of policies because you have these sectors that generate high uh, knowledge spillovers. But as so shown in this chart, many countries rely on foreign spillovers. In other words, they rely on innovation that is done elsewhere. So your domestic industrial policies can't really impact that. What this really means is that an economy's openness is, an important, is also an important factor uh, when assessing the gains from uh, industrial policy. So with that in mind, let me, let me, let me highlight what, what our main result is on industrial policy. We show that using industrial policy to promote innovation can deliver economic or social returns if the following conditions hold. Firstly, the social benefits or the externalities can be well identified. Can you measure them? You know, can governments measure what are the externalities? What is the market failure? If there's a market failure or there's a distortion, then can governments uh, uh, address it? Now, I, sh I should say at the outset, governments may adopt industrial policy for many different reasons. And in, in, in our chapter, we talk about this. It could be economic considerations. It could be security, sort of, sort of non-market distortions that could be important. In this chapter, we're focusing on uh, those policies that governments ostensibly talk about when it comes to spurring innovation, boosting growth prospects. So we're, we're, we're sort of making this distinction, and we're talking about what are the market failures and where are the externalities. If they are well measured, so that's one condition. Secondly, if subsidies are provided to sectors that generate higher knowledge spillovers uh, to other uh, sectors. Third. Uh, in, in important condition is that governments have the administrative or technical capacity to vet these projects. Right? They really understand what the life cycle of these projects are. They can vet uh, 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 these projects at, at an early stage. They can recalibrate support as conditions change and so forth. So, so do they have the technical and administrative uh, capacity to avoid, say, capture? And, and fourth, that policies do not sort of discriminate against uh, foreign firms, which can be self-defeating, as, as I've shown you in the previous chart, since a lot of innovation is also done um, elsewhere. And even large economies tend to rely on innovation that's done elsewhere. So the chart on the right, uh, if, you can, if you can see that, so it shows that for a large economy with a benevolent government, so this is a good government, with a large economy with a benevolent government, it can benefit from subsidizing more sectors that generate higher research uh, spillovers to other sectors. And that's sort of shown in the, the dark blue line. Right? But you can see that these gains can quickly turn into losses if the government capacity is weaker. So you're moving from left to right 
of the charge. So there's misallocation of resources, the government doesn't have enough information about what the, what, what the firms are doing, or they're just random policy mistakes. So there can be a, a series of things that can lead to uh, uh, um, lower uh, gains. Right? And for, for small open economies, and this is shown in the gray line, um, the, 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 gain, the gains from doing so can be even smaller because m much of your innovation is borrowed from, from abroad. Right? Now, that said, take a look at the dash line. What is this telling you? We're s th what this line is saying is that the welfare gains can be particularly high in the case of innovation that accelerates the development of green technologies right? to lower uh, carbon emissions. Why? Because there can be, there are large social benefits, there are large externalities from greenhouse gas uh, emissions and using these technologies. But even there, we show that implementing the right level of support to each sector is not straightforward. Okay? The chart on your left shows the optimal change in sector level research and development relative to no industrial policies as a function of the green intensity of the sector. So, Greener sectors should receive more fiscal support. We know that because of externalities and, and, and market failures, but this relationship is far from linear. Knowledge spillovers can generate an important, play, play an important role. Now, not all green sectors are equally important. Not all green sectors uh, generate large knowledge spillovers. And knowledge can spill over between green and brown sectors. Uh, over time, so it's not really straightforward. And again, when we think about green sectors, are we are we focusing on technologies that are low car that are really essentially uh, generating innovation in low carbon technologies, or it's something else? Not very uh, clear cut. And the, the the fiscal monitor also chapter also looks at historical cases, um, and these the, again the example is less than uh, clear cut. Right? Historical examples show that even when there are uh, 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 benefits in s specific cases. Um, there can be policy mistakes, yeah. uh, even when uh, these types of um, approaches succeed in transforming industries, the EV sector in China, for instance, or Airbus in, in Europe, there can be large fiscal costs and there can be other distortions that are, that, that are uh, created. Okay, so turning then to the second question, what fiscal instruments, very quickly, uh, can be uh, used to support innovation. I, I want to just step back a little bit and talk a little bit about what's been happening, this long-term trend that we, uh, that we observe across countries. So what we observe is that research and development that's publicly funded or done by public uh, uh, um, um, entities, the government for instance, uh, has kind of has remained stable or actually declined in most countries. And R&D that is financed by firms has actually uh, increased over the last two uh, decades. And the chart on the right hand side uh, shows is that there's sort of been a shift in innovation policies implicitly, right? The implicit subsidy rate to firm R&D uh, uh, um, expenditures has almost tripled. Right? So there's an, the firms are actually doing a lot more. But there's an important distinction. A lot of the R&D done by firms tends to be incremental in nature. Uh, uh, it, it tends to be commercially oriented, uh, and, and it's very different from, say, fundamental or basic research, and we talk about what fundamental or basic research uh, is conducted by the government, and there's a large literature that has shown, using specific examples, micro-studies as well, that fundamental research can have broader uh, applicability and generates larger uh, knowledge uh, spillovers to other countries and also across uh, for a longer period of time. So, all right, so, what is an appropriate innovation policy mix for um, countries of the technology frontier? The table here compares the increase in total R&D spending per dollar or per euro, if you will, of uh, the fiscal cost for each uh, instrument. And we, these estimates shown here are based on a meta-study of the existing literature as well as uh, new analysis. And the ones in green are the ones that are sort of found to have a larger bang uh, for the buck. Now, you can see that you know, policy design really, really matters. There is no one size sort of fits all. Uh, grants can be more useful for uh, young, uh, innovative uh, firms, uh, for, exam uh, for example, while tax incentives um, make sense and, and can actually spur innovation if they're easy to access. I and mean, there's been a lot of sort of studies that have found that many of these tax incentives are, or exemptions are captured by large uh, firms and there's a lot of defensive patenting that stifles innovation by, 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 by smaller firms. So there's that. Uh, um, and then, as I've mentioned, public R&D, uh, which is necessary for fundamental research, can have a large uh, bang for, uh, for the buck. 
So for a complementary mix of effective tools, uh, we estimate a fiscal multiplier over the long term about three to four, which is kind of smaller than what we find uh, in, in, in the literature. But what this means is that increasing spending on these policies by about 0.5 percentage points of GDP, or about 50% of the current sort of average that you see in OECD uh, uh, economies, could raise GDP by about 2% over the long run. Now, we've only talked about fiscal policies. There's many other sort of complementary uh, uh, policies, structural, competition, financial, uh, and other tax type policies uh, uh, that can matter, procurement uh, that can matter. Um, and, and we talk about that uh, in, the, in the monitor. Now, moving to the technologically advanced, uh, less advanced uh, economies and firms, we, en we emphasize that the priorities differ for them. Homegrown innovation can be very uh, uh, costly for a lot of emerging market uh, developing economies. So for these countries, technology diffusion really matters. And I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I'm not going to really go over these slides, but what we, really, we show sort of very carefully that for these types of uh, countries, what really matters from a domestic standpoint is having um, conducive conditions. So do you have the infrastructure in place? Do, 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 do workers have the requisite skills? And these things are really important for countries to be able to absorb and adapt uh, technologies that are developed elsewhere. The, the, the one point I wanted to make before sort of uh, uh, ending my presentation is that what's really important uh, in the case of Europe, for instance, is this, this gap that, that has sort of grown between the frontier firms and the laggard firms. And this gap has been emphasized by research at the OECD, the EIB, and others uh, uh, elsewhere. So diffusion of technology is incomplete if it only helps the top or the frontier firms in, in a country. And we know that this gap has, has risen, has, has, has increased over time uh, in, 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 in many uh, countries. So, so our analysis here shows that fiscal policies that improve sort of infrastructure, ICT connectivity, they can be really important, both for, for countries and firms to harness the, the, the potential benefits from green and digital transformations that are, that are ongoing uh, uh, currently. So based on, uh, based on our analysis, um, our chapter concludes with the following four takeaways. Um, first, you know, be careful when you're thinking about t targeting specific sectors. Uh, countries need to, to understand what the social gains are, where the market failures are, what the distortions are, and have the requisite capacity to administer uh, um, uh, such uh, policies. Um, countries at the technology frontier could reassess the, the current innovation toolbox that they use, whether it's appropriate for the innovation life cycle, for the type of firms uh, that, th that they have uh, in the economy. Countries below the, the countries and firms below the technology frontier, uh, the focus really should be on how to spur, what kind of policies are needed to spur technology diffusion. And, 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 and finally, you know, closer, <laughs> you, and this is really relevant for not just advanced economies, but this is particularly relevant for emerging market and developing uh, countries. The closer in international cooperation and greater exchange of knowledge are absolutely critical. And, and this, is, this is really important if countries are going to harness the benefits of ongoing uh, green um, and digital transformation. So let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ida. That was really good and uh, also very, very impressive uh, timekeeping. Uh, I suspect uh, in some places you went too fast, but we can we can deepen those in the in the discussion. And Roman, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. So thank you very much uh, for this uh, for inviting me, Jeremy, and also to to Eda for for the very insightful presentation of the uh, of the fiscal monitor. And uh, I would say it has many, many lessons on how fiscal policies, but also industrial policy, as uh, Jeromin was uh, mentioning before, can be used to boost innovation and, and, and growth. But in my comments, I think I will try to focus only on three elements in the report. I agree with the, with the statements of the, of the IMF report in general, but I think that uh, some of them might benefit from certain nuances you know, to better understand the, the kind of EU perspective on, on this. So I will start by basically mm, uh, making a first point, which is that the, the report by the IMF uh, kind of highlights three conditions that are necessary, let's say, for industrial policy to be advisable, let's call it this way, 
all need a high tick on the box, so sh social benefits and externalities. You were mentioning this uh, error right now, knowledge uh, spillovers and administrative capacity. And I actually agree to this, but I think that we have also taken to, to take into account that the world has changed. Uh, I mean, EU industry is these days operating in a very complex context when there is a mix of kind of long-standing challenges that we're all very familiar with. And this is climate change, aging of the population, a strong digitalization of industry and society. And uh, this is uh, kind of, uh, it gets um, accumulated or mixed with a number of uh, crises that we are all also very familiar with. And this leads to what some people call the age of disorder, like um, Alex Stubb, when he was in the European University Institute before becoming the president of Finland, which is basically a coupling of uh, geopolitical tensions with a higher degree of systemic uncertainty and a lot of animals out there in the forest, uh, whether these are black swans, gray rhinos, uh, or elephants in the room, hedgehogs, and all that, which basically they, 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 they tend to uh, be a uh, personification of, of this higher degree of uncertainty. The Economist was referring a couple of months ago to something called the Mona Lisa effect. No, when you look at Mona Lisa, you might see that she smiles in a certain way, and then you look again five minutes later and you see something different. And this is because the contours of the Mona Lisa face have kind of become uh, blurred because of the sfumato that Leonardo was using around the, the, the face. So that's a little bit what I think is happening in the current economy with all this higher degree of uncertainty and the geopolitical tensions that some of the traditional contour lines of economic variables are also becoming blurred. And uh, we in the EU, we put in place, you know, a certain number of responses, common and coordinated responses to those challenges, but it's clear that there is kind of this new reality that is putting somehow the model to, to a test. Uh, let me see if I can, where do I have to point? Oh, here. So basically, in this context, I would just like to show you this, which is a visual example of why I think that economic security matters in this kind of changing world. In my team, we developed a methodology to identify the strategic dependencies of the EU. This is uh, as your model and kind of an aseptic and data-driven uh, fashion of identifying these goods. We start from the whole universe of traded goods, more than 5,500. We put some two filters, one to kind of um, uh, filter for strong import concentration, and then the second one for the let's say, low possibilities to replace those goods by production within the, the single market. And we, we detect uh, 204 um, intermediate inputs, raw materials, and other kinds of goods for which the EU is facing strategic dependencies. And we see that in import value, most of those goods are coming from China, also in terms of the number of, uh, of, of dependencies. And most of them are appearing in what we call sensitive industrial ecosystems. So from energy intensive industries, for example, some kinds of raw materials that are essential for the clean tr green transition, to health with some pharmaceutical ingredients, to renewables, some inputs, again, you know what I mean, for, for clean technologies. So we see a certain number of risks for the EU and basically two. One is unintended supply chain distress that gets magnified, let's say, by these strategic dependencies. And the second one is that we're kind of opening as well the window with these dependencies for a potential weaponization of some of them. And we have seen recently examples in terms of, for example, er, uh, export restrictions of certain raw materials such as gallium, germanium, and others which have had an impact on the EU economy. So with this, I mean that these risks are high today. And in my reading, they somehow set the basis for targeted public interventions and industrial policy solutions. And we have seen how these have increased also from your uh, presentation era when you were mentioning the data of uh, global alert. The second point I wanted to make is that your report calls for a focus on fundamental research and innovative startups. And again, I fully agree that these are two very important areas to set a focus on for to have an innovative knowledge driven economy. Also in the EU, we have seen the European Research Council, European Innovation Council and other kind of bodies taking good shape over time here in the EU. But we need to remember that here in the EU we're also facing quite strong weaknesses in innovation in terms of, for example, of applied research in certain areas which are related to critical technologies and also a lack of scaling up of innovation towards uh, commercialization. And um, <coughs> here basically, well, I think I went too fast, wait a second. Ah, yeah. Here basically you have two indicators. This is a little bit the tip of the iceberg to illustrate this. But if you look at the left hand side, you see the PCT pa patents on AI. We were discussing AI before, so that's uh, quite timely. <laughs> Where you see that China has actually quickly overtaken the EU already in 2015 and, the, and is performing below the, the, the US, uh, about 20% below. And this is, of course, creating risks 
also for future like kind of technological dependencies of the EU, where EU businesses might have to rely on third partner countries for critical tech technologies, for critical services. Jeromin the other day was uh, you know, with us in DigiGrow and he was also mentioning financial dependencies, for example. So these are issues which I think we have to keep in mind. The second one is that we're facing a, a scale-up gap with the US and, uh, and this is, for instance, what you have on the right-hand side is the number of unicorns. So we see that there are much many more unicorns in the US and in China than in the EU. Uh, these numbers uh, are actually quite telling, but you have more than 700 in the US, around 300 in China, and only 90 in the EU. And this is data from uh, a forthcoming report by my colleagues in DG Research and Innovation. And if you combine this with the fact that also in the, uh, in the US you have five to seven times more venture capital funding, and that the venture capital funds are more shallow and more fragmented in the, in the, in the EU, then you see that uh, there are areas where we need to make quite some progress like Capital Markets Union and others if we want young productive firms to kind of um, scale up in the, in, the, in the right way and we don't want resources to get stuck in less productive firms. But Rainilla knows about this much better than I do, so I will, uh, on that one I will stop here. And then we have the third point, which is basically that your report is calling for a stronger coordination of industrial, of innovation policies. And I think in the context of the EU's economic security strategy, partnering is indeed, you know, very central, and I very much agree to that. But there are also two other elements which I think are relevant, and uh, one of them is, is um, what we call promote. So we should not forget that we also need to promote the competitiveness of the EU, and that this requires a strong single market, uh, that we invest in skills, we have a conducive regulation, uh, we have more research and innovation investments, and I, I think that major actions have been taken here. You mentioned some of those, Critical Raw Materials Act, Next Zero Industry Act, CHIPS Act, all to kind of set the right conditions for the EU to reindustrialize in these critical areas. But we also have to take into account that protecting is also important, protecting from economic security risks. For example, there has been a proposal to strengthen the uh, EU's FDI uh, screening mechanism, because certainly foreign direct investment can be a source of growth, but certain investments may also affect uh, security. For example, when EU businesses supply critical technologies and then these EU businesses get acquired. No? So besides the partnering dimension, and there the, I think we have an, uh, an, an understanding and the great example here is raw materials diplomacy, where over the last three years there have been a lot of raw material partnerships done with, uh, let's say, like-minded countries, but also resource-rich countries to the benefit of both, like Canada, Chile, uh, Congo, Ukraine, and many others, so many different nature. But the promote and the protect um, kind of dimension, I think, are also extremely important. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Excellent, and I also see we, we're gonna have a good uh, debate. Um, all right, uh, I think we'll continue in, in this order. Let's have, a, well, Reinhilde can go. Oh, you want to go last? Okay, <laughs> you guys fight, you guys decide, you guys decide. Okay, so uh, Reinhilde, please. Start. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I, I agree with all the main findings, so I'm not going to repeat them here, but I think it's also very good that you have actually numbers on there because this also confirms and makes it much more harder uh, a lot of stuff that we already knew here. Uh, and the, the big advantage of using macroeconomic modeling for that is also it allows to assess all the indirect effects and all the complementary policies like competition policy, regulation, uh, which are also very important to get these, these positive returns uh, here. Um, so what I would like to bring in is a bit more my micro perspective uh, on this from studying innovation and also the EU uh, perspective. By the way, I was wondering, should we classify EU with the technology leaders or the technology laggards? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, it's not so... <laughs> yep. <coughs> yeah, but on, on average, whether we more <laughs> in the one or the next. Anyway, so I think what's really a very critical point you also make is this: the power of R&D and also the motive why we need public support for that comes from the spillovers, the knowledge uh, externali externalities here, which really make this very powerful. Um, uh, it's very often taken for granted uh, here. Uh, like, for instance, the EU RTD, when they 
says the uh, framework program, they come up with a number of five to one. So every euro that you spend on framework program should get five returns. And it's all basically driven by how much do you, how big do you think that these pillovers will actually be here? And so that's why I think it's really very important that we get a good handle on this, that we can measure these pillovers rightly. And that's not so obvious. It uh, wasn't clear to me what you were using in, in your modeling here. So we typically, we, we use like trades. Uh, so because trade or FDI, because it's very often embodied in goods and services here. But you know that's only imperfectly related to true knowledge pillovers uh, here. Patent citations comes closer to knowledge pillovers here. But that we also know from micro evidence that that's also a bad indicator here because patent citations is purely, it's a legal requirement to refer to prior art here. Um, and surveys have shown that actually a lot of inventors don't even know about the patents that, that, that uh, are citing them simply because that's uh, imposed by examiners uh, here as a kind of prior art here. And the analysis that we do with text mining, where you use concepts again in other patents, doesn't correlate at all with patent citations here. So just to illustrate how difficult it is to get a good grip on these patent citations here. Plus, it's also not relevant for adoption, which I think uh, you clearly point out is that's a different game to play than, than the creation here. And patent citations are only impacts on follow-on innovations, nothing to do with uh, spillovers on, on adoption. Uh, here. Um, so first point, very hard to measure this, but it's very critical to really get the power of, of uh, fiscal policies for R&D here. Then the other second uh, dimension, suppose we could measure it, is, is what do we think that the size of spillover should actually be here? And I think we should really think about this way more endogenously. So what drives spillovers? And on the two sides, because incoming and outgoing spillovers are very often uh, related here. And that's also what we know for micro studies looking at firms, how they manage their, out their, their knowledge flows out uh, and in here. Now, we also know that these links are not obvious uh, here to realize. You cannot take them for granted, especially when they need to cross institutional boundaries, which happens when it goes from science to basic research to applied research and innovation here, because very often this means, ah, ah, yes, <laughs> sorry. <coughs> Because that usually means that the, so the science and, and the early stage research is done in universities and public research organizations, and when they have to, to transfer to, to uh, companies, that's usually an institutional gap that, that uh, is not so easy to, to, to come by. And actually, the example of AI is a very nice one, because it holds, particularly for Europe, this difficulty to connect, uh, because we're very good in AI publications. We know we're in terms of AI patents uh, here, just to indicate how difficult these links uh, actually are. And recent research by uh, Ashish Aurora and others from Duke University, they've actually identified that this has become an, an increasingly bigger problem here, because companies are shifting away from from being engaged in basic research and science, what they used to do before, like for instance with the Bell Labs uh, here, and they're shifting all of these early TRLs to uh, leaving that to, to universities and public research organizations. But that actually requires that then you need to link, and that link is really very difficult here. And this is why overall actually the performance of the innovation system is going down because of this difficulty uh, of spillovers uh, here. Um, also because a lot of intermediaries, like for instance the, the spin-offs and the startups, which are very often the link from science to innovation here, that that process is also not so obvious uh, here. Um, uh, not so obvious in the sense that these startups need to also be able to grow to critical scale to be really uh, playing this role of intermediaries and, and attractive candidates for takeover by, by companies here. And because companies, if they are not sufficiently engaged with basic research, also don't know exactly what kind of ac acquisitions to make that are the most efficient here. So this whole process of spillover is actually not so obvious, not even in the US <laughs> uh, here, uh, and definitely holds also for the EU because we uh, had already been very, very poorly performing on, on this connecting uh, dots uh, here. Um <coughs> So the question then is, what kind of R&D policy would you need, fiscal policy, in order to make sure that you get the spillovers also realized uh, that you could expect from the, and particularly from the basic uh, research, which you correctly point out is where the more, more, more scope is, but also exactly where the most difficulties are to, to, to make them realize uh, here as well. Um, okay, so 
And again, the example of AI is very important example here where Europe should really, <laughs> because we are good in science, we're not good in, in, in AI patterns and using AI for innovation here, and, and, and we're losing a lot of our innovation power because of this difficulty to connect in, connect the dots particularly for, for this technology of, of AI. In terms of, so what would that mean in terms of policies? Um, I think it's really trying to make sure that you target the right kind of policies where spillovers, the potential of spillovers are not being realized and where you need to, to, com to come in uh, here. Um, <coughs> and there the trend, I have to say, is, not, is, is, is going in the wrong uh, di direction here, certainly at the EU level. Support for, for higher TRL type of projects is where the trend is going to, but that's not where the problem is and where the highest spillovers are and where you need to actually. So I, I would like to also see what the others think of this shift towards higher TRLs uh, here. Um, and even for the lower TRLs, uh, so the sympathetic research that we did here in Bruegel already a couple of years ago showed actually that a lot of grants are actually not, di not directed towards where the spillovers are, but simply where the highest commercial values are. That's what, what the public sector selects here. So it means it deals more with the capital market imperfections maybe, but not with where the highest social value is. And so again, is this because of a capacity to not being able to select this? Is it because there is no, inf no enough information to really pick this here? But so grants to, to public, to basic research and where the early stage spillovers are is not obvious. And so far we've not actually been able to do very, very well of the on this here. And then a final point I'd like to make in terms of, so spillovers, yes, but not an easy process here. And I think we need to, think way more micro on where actually the bottlenecks are and the market failures are in getting the spillovers that, that we actually could uh, have uh, here. Um, in terms of um, the strategic autonomy and the sovereignty <laughs> issue that uh, Ramon also identified here. So basically for me that's also an externality basically because uh, having security of supply to public good which companies or private actors will be under invest investing in so we need therefore also indeed uh, have that on the radar of public support, particularly for strategic autonomy, but rather than identifying where the critical dependencies are and then trying to build walls around this, with protecting here, I think it's a very dangerous strategy because protecting and building walls means... <laughs> So it means no outgoing spillovers, but also no incoming spillovers. Uh, and that could actually really kill um, the whole idea. And also um, because, so what we should actually be doing is actually use research and, and, and innovation to change the critical dependencies uh, here. And particularly at the early stages, the low R TRLs here, so to come up with new technologies which would make us less dependent uh, here. But in order to be able to do that, we have to, to keep open here because we need these international spillovers in these early stages here so that we can build that strategic autonomy through, uh, through uh, research. Here. Great. So you have now reconciled everything, uh, Van Hilde. Okay, uh, Renaud, please, uh, your turn. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, thank you. So um, it was really an uh, interesting uh, article and, uh, um, well, learned a lot by reading it. Uh, and indeed, so um, I use a bit the, the, the summary of uh, Ramon regarding the, the, the three main elements, which were social benefits, knowledge spillover, and administration capacity. So well, clearly, completely aligned with you on, on those ones. As a good consultant, I have prepared some slides. And this is one that, that we are frequently using for our clients to say, well, if you're indeed going to innovation or any kind of investment, well, try to have a look at the 360. So it's what we call 360 would be combination of tax incentives and cash grants. But as you can see here, well, there is also the need for when you're starting, in fact, your, your business, you have the need for capital, uh, corporate equity. And then, well, there is also the discussion with uh, respect to, to, to debt. And the maturity of the company will, will in fact, somewhere uh, influence the choice that you, you will take patent box, which has been indeed seen as not really effective to, to create value, um, is, is, well, still a really attractive uh, uh, tax schemes for more multinational than, than startups. Startups will clearly look much more into corporate equity, national R&D grants, and potentially indeed will 
by evolving towards sustainability grants and, and incentives. Um, what I would like to, uh, to point out here is that, well, clearly in, in terms of corporate equity, there is a bit of lack of availability, I would say, in the European market. We see indeed startups a bit uh, struggling to, to attract, in fact, uh, um, venture capitalists, um, but also to, to obtain, in fact, uh, loans vis-à-vis -vis the bank. Um, what is also really important is that, well, the my clients, I would say, the companies, needs really um, transparency into the, uh, the, the tax incentives law. And, and you are seeing, and then I'm making a, a link with the administration capacity. Administration capacity to develop new policies, yes. But I can tell you that where I'm struggling is with the tax authorities when they are auditing, in fact, the tax incentives and convincing them that that project was an R&D project or that project is meeting, in fact, the condition is, is really sometimes really a, a challenge. So I think that, well, policy from tax incentive point of view, yes, but at the same moment, you need somewhere an educated tax officer assessing, in fact, the condition of your uh, the tax incentives. Um, and I have really some really bad stories, uh, would that be in, in Belgium, France, um, or Italy, where in fact the, the tax officer was really not supporting, in fact, the law which had been implemented and had really strict interpretation of that law, which was finally reducing a bit the effect and creating uncertainty into the market. So in fact, the companies were saying, okay, well, it is a nice tax incentive, but at the end it's really, really insecure. And, and the interpretation of the tax authorities is different than what is in the law. So that, that's also a really an important element, I think, to take into consideration, the, um, the capacity of the tax authorities to really assess that. On my next slides. Oh, that, no, no, wait, there he is. So we are also using frequently that slide to, to explain a bit to our clients, okay, well, with respect to the, uh, the TRL, you will have access to different type of, of, uh, of uh, in, in, um, incentives and and well you see that tax incentives is somewhere a bit covering the entire tier one to nine but well i fully agree with you that a lot of the fundamental research is somewhere within the public r d centers which usually do not have really access to tax incentives because they are not taxed so they will not really be attracted by that they will be much more attracted by by grants cash grants um, on, on the, the next slides, well, we have tried here in a, in a recent seminar that we have given, and sorry, I, I took only the, the slide which was on France. We had the same for Germany and, and also for Italy, but uh, trying in fact to compare the uh, EU program with the US program and where in fact the member states are covering also what is a bit missing into the, um, the EU program. And, and clearly, in fact, it was much more into the, uh, the production of green manufacturing, green energy or green production. Those were, in fact, the areas where EU was not that present in terms of supporting the investment. Um, clearly, well, the, the innovation fund is a really attractive one to somewhere finance the, um, the CapEx investment. But the CapEx investment are always a bit, from a tax perspective, a bit the one missing, in fact. Uh, I see a trend with respect to CapEx investment to, uh, to reach sustainable uh, goals. But in terms of R&D or in terms of production, well, there is there clearly a lack into the tax incentive regimes across, I would say, the world, uh, having discussed a bit this with, with my colleagues. Uh, we see a modification thanks to the TCTF um, and ability, for example, in, in, uh, in Italy to have access via the uh, transition 4.0, transition 5.0 to really tax incentives on CapEx. You have the same in France with C3IV, but it is indeed temporary measures. So, well, question would be, okay, would that stay, in fact? Um, I think that, well, that, that was it, I would say, for the first conclusion. But then also, it was really interesting, your conclusion regarding emerging markets. I can testify that, indeed, my clients investing in, in emerging markets are not interested into tax incentives, much more into infrastructure, um, skills, jobs, uh, grants available uh, close to, in fact, uh, infrastructure areas. Um, but when we see an emerging market starting to have a cluster regarding, for example, H2 production or ammonia production in, in, when, when you're exporting to EU, we see there a trends to attract, in fact, companies which will be around that uh, ammonia production capacity and they're starting to attract those, um, well, spillovers and um, other suppliers 
will start to be interesting via tax incentives. So again, in terms of maturity and really targeted tax incentives, that I think that uh, also uh, is a good example. And to conclude, um, because we have seen uh, tax incentives from the emerging market, is that relevant, yes or no? Conclusion is not really. What about uh, tax incentives in the EU to collaborate with the emerging markets? Uh, because while we have indeed a lot of uh, funding which is put into the, co uh, the um, cooperation, but what if somewhere by involving the, uh, the, the private sector via tax incentives, saying, okay, well, if you're starting to work with university located in Africa, or if you're starting to work with startups located in Africa, well, the tax incentive that you can benefit in EU will be higher than if you are doing that with a local startup. That would be my conclusion. Okay, this has been really great. Uh, so uh, we are also doing okay in terms of time because you have all been um, very good on that, um, particularly Raymond. Uh, so uh, I would suggest we have one more one round uh, on the podium and so we're going to do it in reverse order and the reason for that is so that you then are able to respond to everything right um, including you know what your discussion said what I'm and so I'm, I'm going to have one question uh, for, for each of you but I mean feel free anyone can answer any of my questions I mean I, I formulated them mainly with a person in mind right so with uh, I guess with Renault my, my point is if you go sort of, you had an interesting idea at the very end, but if you go a, a step uh, further, so from, from your perspective, which is a very applied one, right? You see how uh, firms uh, utilize various forms of support and you advise them how to do it. You know, what, what, what is sort of the main thing the EU, the Commission could do, could do better, basically, to improve, uh, to make R&D support and uh, um, adoption more more effective, right? So is there a missing element in the architecture uh, or, you know, potentially are we duplicating forms of uh, support? Um, Reinhilde, uh, we, th there was an interesting result uh, in this, uh, in the model uh, that is underlies the first part of the chapter. And, and by the way, it's very impressive that you have, I believe this model was probably written by the authors of the chapter, right? So this is sort of a real flex of the, fiscal uh, monitor, you know, you're sticking it to the wheel, we have uh, model-based, um, uh, you know, insights here. So there was one uh, one result which was quite striking, which um, is that if you're a small open economy, basically the, the effects of industrial policy are always uh, zero or negative. And I guess the intuition for that, even though I haven't read the model, is that if you have, you know, spillovers, everything is spillovers, if you have a tiny economy with just one firm, you subsidize that firm, you know, all the benefits will go abroad and nothing uh, to the economy. So how, how literally, uh, uh, Ranhel, did you think we should take that result? So should we advise Belgium, uh, being a relatively small economy, not to do industrial policy, but, you know, Germany may be a bit better, or do different rules apply in the EU, because we sort of worry about EU effects uh, overall, but if we do worry about EU effects, doesn't it follow from that that really all industrial policy should be at the EU level? I mean, the, I guess the, my main intuition is that p perhaps even in small economies you can have local spillovers, and if you have more than one firm, then Take it might work. One. Yes. <laughs> you can have large domestic. You can have innovation hubs, and you can have large domestic spillovers in specific sectors. So you, can, you can have that. I mean, there's evidence. You, you, you're not really supposed to answer <laughs> yet, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you think <laughs> it. <laughs> You, you 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 can you you can distance yourself from your own model uh, when when your turn comes, um, uh, uh, Roman. Uh, so you know we we certainly I mean you you and I agree and I, I have a feeling that in the end everyone in this panel will agree uh, once you give it the pr sort of proper externality twist that that economic security considerations can be a justification for industrial policy, the, but the, where I was a little less sure is in your th the final line of your slides, um, where it, you know, this justification seems to be about competitiveness in a sense that might go beyond uh, economic security. And so could you maybe be very clear whether you think that aside from economic security, there is a competitive res rationale for um, uh, uh, industrial policy uh, that is discriminatory, right? I mean, because your, your caveat on economic security was 
you know, sometimes you need discriminatory policies. Uh, but do you think that there is, you know, take, setting aside uh, economic security considerations, there is any rationale for discrimination? And so particularly, in particular, do you think that it could be the case that discriminatory industrial policies deliver higher competitiveness in the sense that growth is higher in the EU or where the, uh, the discriminatory policy is applied with discrimination than without discrimination? Okay, so that's, uh, that's a, a real question. Uh, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Biden people would say yes. I'm hoping that you're going to say no, but you know, I'm not completely sure. Uh, so think carefully. <laughs> the weight of the EU is on your shoulders in this answer, okay? <laughs> and, and then finally uh, on uh, uh, ERA, how far do you want to push this uh, uh, result that um, uh, you know, industrial policy is effective only if there is no discrimination against foreign firms. It's a, it's a super strong language. Uh, and so, you know, obviously I, I understand from, that from the perspective of the International Monetary Fund and from a global perspective, discrimination is bad, limits spillovers across countries. But from the perspective of an individual country, uh, is, it, is it really that uh, drastic? It, it seemed to me that the intuition behind the result is a little bit that if you allow foreign firms in your economy, somehow, or if you trade with them or something like that, you are more likely to benefit from spillovers of, you know, industrial policy abroad, some, something like that, right? But, but that's a different argument on whether your own industrial policy uh, can be discriminatory, you know, right? You want to uh, allow FDI, you want to do trade, all these things. But th those are, you know, in general, you want openness to benefit from foreign spillovers. I completely buy that. But that is a, a, a different argument than saying, uh, you know, we are not going to get the benefits of our own industrial policy if we discriminate. That's, it strikes me as, as even though I, I dislike <laughs> discrimination, I dislike it because I'm a globalist at heart. Uh, but but I'm not sure one can go as, as far as you did. Okay, so we're going to go now in reverse order. Uh, Renaud, please start. All right, so with respect to your question, um, how to improve the, uh, the, the tax policy in the EU, um, well, on R&D incentives. Um, first, I think that, um, well, the elements regarding spillover is, is really important. Um, there is a lot of a way to, to, to interpret it, but I think that's the example in the article which was referring to sustainability is really a good one. So in fact, considering that the spillover of my R&D tax incentives should be on fact on sustainability. There I think that there is a way where EU could intervene is to define, okay, when will that be a positive sustainability impact in fact. And, and uh, with the CSRD regulation, with the, uh, the taxonomy, I think that we start to have, well, uh, tools which will allow the tax authorities to verify if in fact there is that existing spillover, yes or no, by having indeed carbon reduction or by having indeed a positive impact on the environment. So I think that there, linking the tax incentives with in fact sustainability spillovers and ensuring that it is really uh, detailed and that we are uh, based in fact the decision on data and not just yes, my R&D will have a positive uh, impact on environment, I think that would be highly relevant. Two, I think that ensuring that tax incentive, R&D tax incentives is not only for the, the cost of the personal, the researcher, but also the capex. I think that prototyping demonstration needs also to be part of the, uh, the scope for R&D tax incentives. And in fact, more than that, I think that the, uh, the scale up and the production uh, investment should also somewhere be considered into the, um, the incentives. Thirdly, but that's not really a recommendation for the, um, the EU, but much more for the member states. I think that indeed the tax authorities are not ready for that. So they can't really assess indeed if a project is R&D, yes or no. They can't really assess if a, the, the project will have a sustainability impact, yes or no. They are not equipped for that. So I think that the member states need also to ensure that well the, uh, the, the, the tax officers are well trained to ensure that well the tax incentives will reach the goal and, and not really uh, focusing on details which are not highly relevant compared to the philosophy of the law. Thank, thank you, Renaud. Renhilde. Yeah. 
Thanks, uh, Jiren. You, you're very good in asking the biting questions. <laughs> and I'm very glad that you gave me the small open economy because it's actually w it was on my notes. I wanted to reply to them, but uh, thought I had no time for that. So would there be no scope for innovation or industrial policy for a small open economy coming from Flanders? Um, that's, of course, very challenging. Um, because I think it does actually, and we have a very good examples of that, I'll come back to that in a minute, because a small open economy should actually design its international and uh, innovation policy in a very open fashion here. So it's on the one hand, design your innovations for global markets, you have to do that anyway, um, and make sure that, so the outgoing spillovers will be important also, uh, but you need to be able to capture the value from that. Uh, think of Israel also, so outgoing spillovers, but making sure that you capture the value, either by going the whole way, having scaled up companies that can capture the value, or by selling your startups or your ideas to international markets here. And if that market works well <laughs> for technology, then you can capture the value for these international spillovers as well. And at the same time, for a small open economy, I think it's also very important that it keeps open for incoming spillovers here. here. Because you're small, you need to work with the best of talents here, and that international openness is very important too. So I think small open economies, exactly because of the international dimension of spillovers can also uh, have an, an industrial policy based on innovation here and, and managing these spillovers here. And I'd like to, to be a bit proud of Flanders in the sense of that that's actually what it also did with IMEC in, in microelectronics and with uh, VIB for biotechnology. Two areas where uh, Europe and Flanders used to be strong in science, but making the connection. And actually they chose to be intermediaries between science and uh, and um innovation here, not having the big players in these markets uh, here, but by trying to be a very good intermediary bridge builder. And that was actually, that needed industrial support from the Flemish government to get started here. Exactly with also the very clear condition that that had to be organized internationally and internationally open uh, here. But that drives good. our innovation success now in Flanders. Is this Thank you. I, I hope uh, Valonia is going to get some credit uh, as, as well at some point. No, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Roma. Yes, thank you very much. No, I think um, uh, to divert a bit from your, uh, for your first uh, more intriguing question, I will start with a second one and then I come back to yours. <laughs> So just because the issue of, uh, I thought it was interesting as well, the discussion around R&D tax incentives. And uh, I think that there, you know, there's, there's we have to depart from the fact that there are clear needs, you know what I mean, for, uh, to boost R&D investments or R&I investment research and innovation in Europe. Because if we look at the figures, we see that we are at 2.2, we all know this, we are far away from the 3%. And actually my colleague in DG Research and Innovation was showing me the other day a graph in which they had estimated that it would be needed to reach the 3% uh, target uh, today, we would need 123 billion euro increase in the, uh, the uh, R&D uh, budgets. Uh, so that's seven times the figure of Horizon Europe, which is representing about 9% of public R&D funding. So the percentage of public R&D funding at the EU level is still relatively small. So when you have a question, uh, I think it was to Rainil de Jeromin on what can the European Union do, I think the question is more what can also the member states do with the European Union to fill in that, uh, that gap. No? Then um, also an important issue here is that um, when I was looking at, this, at these figures, I saw also that the R&D intensity was greater for the top 2,500 firms in this R&D industrial investment scoreboard. And there has been an increase in the last 10 years due mm, basically to high R&D intensive firms gaining a lot of shares. So there's a lot of concentration, again, you know, to come back to, to your story. And, uh, and then when I was thinking about tax incentives, which came in, in your slides, Renault, as something that was kind of covering a wide range of both your slides on instrumentation and on the TRLs. Uh, and then I was thinking, okay, uh, there are many elements, you know, I mean, uh, that have to be considered here for tax incentives to be the right tool to, 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 to use. I mean, the, the degree of development of the R&D system, economic structure, the capacity of absorption of grants in an economy, you know, directionality that you want to inject, you know, to your investments, firm size, class, the nature of the sector, so many other things. So it's a complicated kind of portfolio of instruments that, 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 that you have to deploy. 
But now let me come back to Jeremy's question, because I know that otherwise he would ask me again, and for a good reason. And I think, you know, I mean, also to, I profit to reply to Rainier, because I think in, in my reading, the EU has not really become protectionist. Um, but it is not also kind of striving for a complete industrial sovereignty. I think that would be uh, kind of absurd, because protectionism or full sovereignty share two features, in my view, and one is that they are undesirable, and the other one is that they are too costly. So open trade is, of course, critical. We are the third largest economy in the world. We have also the largest share of exports of goods and services, even after Brexit. And I think here the issue is how to ensure a balanced approach, where you can boost resilience and at the same time ensure uh, economic security. And that's where my answer to, um, uh, to Jeromin comes, that uh, yes, in, uh, I mean, that industrial policy uh, you know, is indeed a very important uh, factor here. But, uh, uh, to deal with economic security, but I think it has also, let's say, uh, it can have some um, indirect uh, impact as well, you know, I mean, on competitiveness, which can be, uh, which can be as well, you know, I mean, a beneficial one. And, uh, for example, if you, um, if you look at uh, the fact that we have a, an energy crisis with energy costs much, structurally much higher in the EU than in the US, like two or three times, we have these unprecedented aggressive strategies, you know, by third partner countries. Some of those were in the slide before. Overcapacities in Chinese manufacturing. Uh, uh, we have uh, production that is very resilient, you know, I mean, manufacturing production, but still in some energy intensive industries, this has been hit. So uh, we have put in place a number of uh, tools under the, um, the kind of industrial plan of the EU. So Net Zero Industry Act, Critical Raw Materials Act, reform of the electricity market. So all those things are not meant as well necessarily to, uh, to kind of uh, boost uh, competitiveness as the main goal, but they can actually facilitate decarbonization of industry. They can enable reindustrialization of green tech and in certain critical raw materials in the EU. So, I mean, is the goal of industrial policy competitiveness? Uh, the, 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 the answer is no, but uh, can it help uh, competitiveness if you deal with economic security? Well, probably the answer is yes. Actually, can I have a two hand on that? So I did not question that the goal of industrial policy might be competitiveness. I very strongly believe that competitiveness is one of the goals of industrial policies, where I define competitiveness as productivity growth, right? In the EU, in absolute terms, and possibly in relative terms, I, I don't know, but certainly in, uh, in absolute terms. My question was whether a in, uh, industrial policy that is aimed at accelerating productivity growth in the EU should have a discriminatory element. So the NZIA, uh, as far as I can see, all instruments we have so far stops short. Uh, it doesn't, at least not openly, right? So there's some procurement uh, tools in the NZIA that are arguably, you know, discrimination in disguise or something like that, but we, we do not step over the line of, of international rules. The question is whether we do not step over the, li of the line of international rules because we think that this would be bad for us, it would trigger discrimination somewhere else, it would, you know, have political costs, or we, whether we don't step over the line because we think that, you know, discrimination is in fact not useful when it comes to strengthen our, our own productivity uh, growth. So that that was basically, and, and so I, I do think the commission certainly is a bit split on this. I think that, you know, your um, a commissioner probably would have wanted a greater degree of discrimination uh, than ended up in the NZIA, uh, and others were completely against it. Now, having put it this way, it's completely unfair for me, because I'm not going to ask you to contradict your commissioner. But anyway, that was the background to my question, and now you can feel free whether you want to add anything to your answer or simply pass, okay? so. No, thank you very much, Eromin. No, I think that there is there is a number of. I mean, I understand uh, clearly your question. Eh? I mean, but I think there is a number of elements here that are also um, you know quite important to consider. And one of them is, for example, whether you can exercise, you know, I mean, a kind of a certain directionality with your policy action without being discriminatory. And I think that's that's what is done. For example, you know, I mean, in both the case of the NZIA and the Critical Raw Materials Act. You set a direction where kind of regulation, uh, resources in terms of investment skills and the rest of the 
of the of the panoply and also you know I mean the part on uh, international relations and partnering they go in the same direction uh, without uh, necessarily let's say uh, without a discriminatory element but with a very clear directionality element which in one way is pointing you know I mean to uh, you know to, to 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 green in this case or, or to critical raw materials so thanks for the question that's uh, that's I, I will stop at there very good. Um, I'm going to hand back to Ada. In the meantime, please think about whether you have a question. And if you are joining us online, you can ask it on Slido. And the um, keyword is uh, hash, hashtag fiscal, I believe. Ada. Thank you. Thank you so much to the panelists for a very good uh, discussion. I think it really adds to the, to the, to the paper and, and brings you know, a lot of granularity uh, to, to uh, what we uh, have discussed. So, so maybe you know very quickly, sort of going to Reinhardt's uh, questions first in terms of how do we think about this. I mean, I, you know, any model is is sort of a, a, a cartoon as we know, right? So the, the the objective was really not to provide a definitive view, but to provide a framework to think about the costs and benefits. And here we look at sort of the cross sector network. So it's micro based and the cross sector network of patent citations, you know, with all the problems that that that, that it may have. But the idea really is, you know, there's a lot of discussion out there and, and people have sort of strong views on is it a good, is it a bad, should you do it, should you not? And we just wanted to provide a framework, right? As a heuristic device to say, all right, can there be welfare gains uh, under certain conditions? Um, can it lead to losses? And that sort of you know leads me to my broader point, which is we're not coming out there and saying industrial policy is bad. I mean, you know, you've made a compelling case, uh, there could be economic security considerations, there's a public good uh, um, aspect uh, there. Uh, there could be other externalities. I mean, you know, take sort of climate change. This is sort of the existential existential crisis of our times. And do we need uh, to to address it? Yes, definitely. And and there's uh, some separate work by my colleagues at the IMF, which shows that actually innovation in low carbon technologies has declined. So there's it's very incremental in nature. It's in areas which could help. But is it going to give you the biggest bang for the buck? The answer is no. So that sort of leads me to the, the, the point that you were making, Romain. I, th I think I think. The devil is totally in the details, right? So we, we and, and this is you know related to the point about tax incentives too. What it, do the gov do governments? Does the EU, in its centrality, have the capacity to vet and administer uh, projects to countries? To, you know, we talked about uh, tax authorities not being able to distinguish uh, what's a good project from a bad one and who should get tax incentives. The question is, do countries have this ability? Uh, to, to vet uh, projects? Do we understand the innovation life cycle? What types of firms? Are we talking about early startups? Are we talking about in the middle uh, where financing really can be a, a constraint? Are we talking about at the very end? Uh, do we really need to be supporting these firms who already have invested uh, so much? So I think the innovation life cycle matters. The nature of firms matters. The type of sectors matters. And there's a, there's a lot of important questions that governments should be asking themselves before jumping on the bandwagon of, of conducting industrial policy. And that was sort of really the bottom line of the report. If you're going to do it, do it right. You know, build, it, build, your, uh, build your technical and administrative capacity. You know, and, 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 and money is fungible. Uh, there's aging costs. There's those costs associated with sort of you know, meeting large uh, 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 other demands for, 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 for um, you know, countries. So, so, so there are trade-offs that countries need to think about. And we know that from, from an individual country pers uh, perspectives, uh, debt levels are high, fiscal s space is limited. So is this the best use of resources? And then this gets to the point that you were making, Jeremy. Are we convinced that this is going to boost productivity and growth? And you know, if, if, even if competitiveness is sort of a side indirect effect, are we, do we know? And actually the evidence so far is not clear. There's a lot of work that's been done on these kinds of policies, micro evidence, macro evidence, and, it, and the evidence is really not clear cut. Um, specific sectoral studies will tell you something. At the aggregate level, there's very little evidence because if, you, if, I, if I were to draw a chart and show you what's happening to productivity in the U.S. and individual countries in the EU, it's sort of there's been a secular decline. So why is it that we've been giving all these tax incentives? You know, countries have been giving all these kinds of tax exemptions. There've been patent boxes in place, all of that, and yet when you measure productivity with all of its caveats, why are we not seeing in the last 15 or 20 years? An increase in productivity. So, and why do we believe that this, you know, going forward, something will be different, right? So, I think that those are the kind of questions that we wanted to put on the table 
uh, and, and, and sort of encourage governments to think about that. Are we so sure that this that we know that we have the answers? Are we so sure so sure that it's going to have the intended objective? So that was sort of, you know, in response to, to and, and, and to your point, uh, um, German. So I think l let, me, let me make two points there. Mm -hmm. In the model itself, you know, you don't really need the foreign you, you don't really need um, uh, spillovers from foreign firms. You could just have random policy mistakes by your own governments and the welfare gains can quickly turn negative. So I mean I think it's important to make this point that you know so, and then there's another aspect to it which is do you need you know do, do you need these foreign sp uh, spillovers. And I and I put up a chart here precisely for that reason to show that even in a large economy like the US, right? So 60% uh, uh, you know you have a lot of you have large domestic spillovers but 40% of knowledge we can again we can quibble over how we measure it is imported. So this is innovation that's done elsewhere. And then you start looking at other countries and, it, and then and the numbers quickly dip, right? So in other words, even large major economies rely, and this is to, to your point, Reinhalder, that even you know, large economies rely on innovation that is done elsewhere, right? So it could be a little bit of sort of shooting yourself in the foot uh, if, you, if you build large walls and, 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 not, and not being clear as to where the distortions are uh, you know what are the nature of market failures? Where the supply? How do the supply chains work? What are the input-output linkages across these sectors? What other distortions are we creating? Without being clear about that, you know, countries could be shooting themselves in the foot. So that's one. That that's the point on on, on, on foreign firms and why why we emphasize that we there are externalities that we need to think about that come from from foreign innovation, and and building large walls can lead to retaliation, which is also costly, by the way. Uh, and, and also, you know, countries need to be mindful that a lot of innovation is done um, um, elsewhere. And be more cost effective in a fiscally constrained world to also rely uh, on, 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 on partners. So that's one point. More broadly, um, as you said, you know, if you think about emerging market and developing countries, for them, you know, they're relying on innovation that's done elsewhere. So wh how, where will they fare? Uh, <laughs> In, in all of this, you know, if, if, there, if countries start adopting inward-looking policies, you know, we believe that emerging market and low-income countries have the most to lose. It's bad for global productivity growth, it's, uh, but it's, it will hurt some countries, the ones who can least afford it the most. Great, um, very clear. Um, do we have a question? I'm not sure, is there anything on Slido? Um, in, I want to quite convince myself, you know, I have, we have Thomas Möller-Nielsen here from Euroactive, and he is paid to ask questions. His questions are usually very good. Uh, Thomas, go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Um, well, I have two, uh, if that's okay, but I'll, be very, very, I'll try to be very, very quick. So one is on scale. So this is obviously a major topic of discussion in Enrico Letta's report. He says, you know, European companies need to scale up in order to be competitive to fund investments. Uh, Mario Draghi in recent speeches has also heavily emphasized scale. Uh, I was particularly interested, I'd be very interested to understand the IMF's uh, view on this. I mean, to what extent, I mean, the Commission seems to be putting, the EU seems to be putting a lot of emphasis on this. Does the IMF agree that this is crucial to, to boost competitiveness? And uh, the second I uh, question is more about um, the issue of discrimination in um, uh, to boost competitiveness in industrial policy. Um, I mean, so uh, uh, Dr. Zettelmeier, so you mentioned that you know the EU might not be willing to do this because of this could open up the possibility of retaliation. It might might also not be useful. I would imagine that there's a third possible reason, which is the charge of hypocrisy would be quite <laughs> um, I don't know, quite blatant. I think. I mean, only a couple of months ago, the European Union, European Commission, opened an investigation into uh, discrimination in China against medical supplies. So I would imagine, is it, would you also agree, or would the panelists agree, that this is a third potential reason as well that the charge of hypocrisy would just become too strong? Anyway, thank you. Yes, I would agree with that. Uh, is any other questions? Otherwise, I will give it back. I think uh, briefly, uh, Reinhard, you had wanted to come in, or Bruno, you wanted to come in? No. Reinhilde, and then um, if Roman wants to say anything, you feel free. Otherwise, uh, um, Eda had, yeah. ha has the last word. I'd just like to, to, to Ramon to clarify a bit my position. So I'm not saying that, that Europe is already protecting and raising uh, barriers uh, here, but the argument very often is, it was also in the IMF report, is the reason why we don't do this is because we are afraid of reciprocity and of closing barriers here. But for me, even if it would still be important to remain open here but what i want to 
make a point out of is what we are not doing enough is actually using our science and research capacity as an alternative to build sovereignty here by looking for other ways of producing new ideas here that makes us less dependent from critical materials that we otherwise have. We are strong in synthetic materials uh, innovations. Let's use that capacity because that's a way to create sovereignty at a way lower cost, even positive to competitiveness uh, in the longer term here without the cost of, of uh, losing out on protection uh, here. And so on, on as a reaction to, to yours, so details indeed matter here, but what your analysis really points out is which details and that it's all about getting these spillovers uh, playing out their maximum role here. Uh, in and out is very important to see these two different, also for the adoption perspective here, but also that they are endogenous and that they depend on the capacity and on the incentives of countries, firms, and in certain technologies to be able to, 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 de to develop these spillovers uh, here. And that's where policy should actually direct itself to uh, here. So those are the details. <laughs> Okay, so uh, maybe if it's okay, I will give Ira the last uh, word. You can reply to anything, but particularly a reply to uh, Thomas's question. And remember, we this is on, on the record. Okay, thank you. No, so Reinhelde, thank you for a very nice summary of uh, uh, exactly what our paper does, which is really, you know, the devil's in the design of the spillovers. And then you sort of can think about the firms, the sectors, um, where in the innovation cycle and what have you. So that, that was very well put. And I think that's exactly what we wanted to, 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 to emphasize. And getting these details right, by the way, it's not an easy task. And it's not an easy task for anyone. I mean, it's, you know, even the most advanced economies have faced challenges doing this in the past. And, and a lot of sort of the innovation that we see uh, uh, um, in the past, or sort of the benefits of the innovation, some of it was good luck as well. So, so luck plays an important role uh, in, in all of this, uh, aside from good intentions and good policies. Um, on, on, the, on the issue of uh, scale up, I mean, definitely scale effects are, are, are important when you think about uh, um, innovation in particular and production, productivity benefits and what have you. But I think it's really important for, for us to, 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 to look at what are the distortions, you know, whether it's product market, labor market, tax systems, other type of distortions that, that hold back productivity growth. Right? So what is it that, that's sort of preventing the kind of innovation? What, what is preventing the kind of innovation that we need from taking place? What has prevented this from the past? So I think a little bit of evaluation of what the gaps are in the past and thinking about, okay, what is needed to, 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 to benefit from this and uh, to harness the potential of these ongoing digital and, 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 and green transformations, what is needed for the future. I think that kind of thinking is really important. And it requires countries to be very granular and to, to figure out what are the distortions? What is holding back productivity growth? Why do we have this large gap between laggards and, and, and these frontier uh, firms? And what kind of specific structural, financial, fiscal policies are needed to close these uh, gaps, which is a different way of thinking about uh, some of these issues. It's much more granular. Great, so we are at the end of our time. This was, uh, I, th I thought, an excellent panel and uh, you know, also a bit of an intense uh, panel. Uh, fortunately, you know, you, you can, the, the, the uh, chapter in the Fiscal Monitor is very clearly written. You can get it on the IMS website, of course, chapter two of the last uh, fiscal monitor, we will post uh, the slides that we received with the consent of the authors on our website. And I also wanted to uh, uh, point out to you um, a, a sort of a nice uh, edited volume that Reinhilde um, and Simon Talia Pietra recently put out on the same subject, on uh, well, specifically on green, green industrial policy. Um, uh, sparking uh, Europe's new industrial revolution. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I close and uh, thank you all very much. <laughs>